We all trust people with credentials, but the credentials alone are not sufficient anymore. In fact, we know now that many people with credentials are not to be trusted. Today, I sit down with Dr. Scott Atlas, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a founding fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. He's also the author of A Plague Upon Our House, My Fight at the Trump White House to Stop COVID from Destroying America. We can't have people running massive, powerful funding agencies and controlling, therefore, all of research for 35, 40 years. We see what happens here. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed deep-seated problems in America's public health apparatus. It's not nearly as objective or data-driven as one might expect. A powerful, unelected few ultimately oversee who gets funded, who gets published in the prominent journals, and who ultimately makes it to the top, says Dr. Atlas. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Dr. Scott Atlas, such a pleasure to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Great to be here. Thank you. You were able to see uh, the previous administration's pandemic response firsthand. And now we're here. You're, you've launched an Academy of Science and Freedom here with Hillsdale and you're having an event around the censorship of science. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a long road. And so why don't you kind of give us a picture of how we got here? It's a complicated question. I'll, I'll start by giving what I saw as I entered this milieu of the White House, the task force, and the uh, advice given to the president. Remember, I got to the White House at the end of July after five to six months of Drs. Burks and Fauci and Redfield running the White House uh, federal policy uh, guidance to the states. And uh, when I entered, the, the country was in a state of uh, significant fear and uh, people were dying and the policies were not working. That is, the infections were not being stopped or prevented from spreading. The high-risk people were still dying the lockdowns were not were already failing, and we were uh, sacrificing our children, uh, really, and a whole younger generation by uh, closing schools, and there was already significant data on that. So when I got in, uh, I, I was very naive at the time. I was, uh, you know, coming from an academic uh, and research uh, environment where I was a health policy scholar at Hoover Institution for more than a decade, full time working on complicated health policy questions. And of course, this was the most complicated health policy crisis that we had faced in a century. In addition, I had come out of 25 years background of high level, really, uh, academic medicine, clinical practice, research, and looking uh, as a medical scientist at data. I expected the same when I entered the White House and thought I would see that same sort of approach. And what that means is an approach based on being very familiar with the data, being very familiar with the publications, reading them yourself, knowing how to critique a study based upon an adequate or an inadequate study design, which therefore makes the conclusions valid or invalid, uh, and engaging in the scientific process, which means a, a sort of a process of listening to the exchange of ideas and understanding what is correct, what is not correct, what is known, what is not known. What I saw was something quite the opposite. What I saw were people who were in uh, purported to be medical science experts, but in fact, they didn't have that behavior. What I heard and saw was the behavior of people who did not have any scientific papers with them at these meetings. They did not have a working knowledge of the published literature. I brought in 15, 20 papers at a time in preparation for my comments uh, to come forward, their comments were just no data whatsoever and sort of a personal ad hominem attack. And this was a, a sort of a behavior that I, I think is a behavior of a bureaucrat interested in covering other bureaucrats and manipulating or working with the media to uh, critique people who had a different opinion, which was myself. I've read a number of the examples of this where you were obviously being slandered. Um, was there anyone that came out and said, Scott, I want to debate you? In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, I wrote this in the book, but there was a conversation I had uh, internally, uh, frankly, with Dr. Fauci, 
uh, who asked me to meet with the other three doctors, the three of them, Fauci, Burks, Redfield. And I said, I'm happy to do that. I would like to bring in some of the outside researchers and epidemiologists and we can have a thorough discussion. That was the end of the conversation. There was no interest in, in discussing the data. Uh, when I had the experts come in and meet with the president and then the next day with the vice president, Dr. Burks pulled out of that meeting. In fact, uh, when the Stanford Medical School uh, group uh, wrote this, uh, posted this letter, it's only one medical scientist, I'll say, uh, Martin Kohldorf wrote in to Stanford publicly at the time and he said in his letter to the Stanford newspaper, I challenge any of the signatories to a debate on the issues and zero of the Stanford professors uh, accepted Martin's challenge, of course, because there is no way to debate that data uh, in, in, because everything I said was correct. Everything I said was said by others too, including, you know, Johnny Anides and later other people uh, about the, uh, the things that uh, were so th thought to be controversial at the time because the data was there. Uh, the proof has come in. It, it would be good if you could kind of a little bit elaborate on that, but, um, but I don't think that's generally known frankly. Well, this is yeah. another problem uh, because there's two parts of the censorship of science that's been going on. One part is by science itself. The university uh, climate of intimidation of people who, who don't agree with what they, uh, the accepted narrative might be. The uh, journals uh, writing opinion pieces that, that really are character slurs on people. Uh, the uh, refusal to publish studies, uh, the funding streams. This is a censorship by science and university communities. And then there's another censorship, which is the media. And I'm including social media here because that is the town square these days. And the media is so critical. I, didn't, I don't think it has to be said, but the media is the interface between science and the public. And so when the media has the power to filter or even kick people off of social media uh, and deem things as misinformation when they're not, uh, they are a, a, a very uh, harmful to the public good and to the public discussion. Uh, so the, the censorship uh, by the media uh, has, has been uh, extraordinarily harmful and, and we, we, we need to get rid of that. So, you know, the lockdowns uh, have objectively been failures. Now, why do I know this? Well, if you look at, I'll, I'll cite a few studies. Bjornskov, uh, in spring 2021, I, I analyzed 24 countries and said that the lock, and showed the lockdowns did not reduce the deaths compared to no lockdowns. Okay, Stanford study, January 2021, by Ben David and colleagues, showed that severe lockdowns did not reduce the spread of the infection. National Bureau of Economic Research, USC Rand Institute in June 2021, Agrawal analyzed 43 countries and the, the United States, the states, and he showed that lockdowns increased the excess deaths. When the lockdowns were implemented, the deaths actually started to go up after they were coming down. And that's true in the United States as well. So when you're talking about how many people died over a non-pandemic year, the excess deaths increased from the lockdowns. The lockdowns killed people. 